During the COVID-19 pandemic, epidemiologic models have been critical planning tools for policymakers, clinicians, and public health practitioners. But there's also been confusion and skepticism caused by what are apparently conflicting conclusions generated by models that use a range of methods and assumptions that aren't necessarily directly comparable. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Caroline Bucky, Associate Director of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Professor Bucky has co-authored a perspective article about COVID-19 epidemiologic models. Professor Bucky, you write in your perspective article that COVID-19 modeling studies generally follow one of two general approaches, which you call forecasting models and mechanistic models. What are the basic principles behind each of these approaches and how are they different? Well, of course, there's not really a clear distinction between the two types, but it's a useful way to divide up the goals and general approaches that each type uses. So in a forecasting model, often you are using a statistical approach to look at what's happened with the data in the past and then make a projection about what you think is going to happen next. So those kinds of models have a very specific goal. And they tend to be most accurate in the short term, of course, because we're better able to forecast short term into the future versus much longer term. And they are designed for a very specific purpose, which is to try to help us understand what's going to happen in the immediate future based on what we've observed in the recent past. By contrast, mechanistic models are often designed to answer a question about how transmission works. And because it includes the mechanistic basis for the spread of the virus between people, we're able to ask questions about how our assumptions about those biological systems that underlie the epidemiology of the disease is expected to play out over the longer term or to ask specific questions about how different aspects of the biology and the epidemiology fit together to create the dynamics of the epidemic. So the goal of these mechanistic models isn't always to precisely predict the numbers that will happen next, but rather to understand the system in some mechanistic way so that we can make sense of what's happening and answer questions either about specific aspects of the biology or to understand what may be happening in the much longer term. So they have a different time scale, scope, and function, and they also have different methods and how they handle the data. So you mentioned one limitation of a forecasting model, that it's better in the short run than the long run. Are there other limitations, and have they played into the confusion about the potential spread of COVID-19? Yes. So because statistical, purely statistical models, so these are ones that don't have a mechanistic description of how a virus spreads in a population, because they don't have that mechanistic underpinning, Forecasting models that are purely statistical, so they take a pattern of the epidemic somewhere else and they apply it to a different place, or they look at the data in the past and they project out into the future. Because there isn't a mechanism in there and a feedback between cases with susceptibles and recovered people and so on, you are limited in terms of what you can say about why something might happen. And you also may be limited in understanding what you've got wrong about the process of transmission. So, for example, you can't simply take an epidemic curve from one place and assume that that type of curve is going to be replicated in another place, especially when the reason for the dynamics in the curve itself, the reason that the infections go down, for example, could be because the epidemic has run out of susceptible people, but it could be because of interventions that we've put in place, like social distancing. So statistical models, by definition, can't distinguish between those two different reasons for an epidemic going away, which means when they're applied elsewhere, because the mechanistic underpinnings of the epidemic itself aren't in the model, it means you can't necessarily make predictions about what would happen in a different setting. And in fact, you say in your article that model accuracy is constrained by our knowledge of this virus. In what ways has ongoing uncertainty about the virus affected the current models? Well, I think the biggest source of uncertainty in the models, and that has affected every kind of model, regardless of what type it is, is that we don't know how many cases there are in the population. So regardless of your framework, trying to make predictions about trying to understand what's happening with an epidemic when we don't actually know where we are in the epidemic curve in any place at a given point in time makes it very, very highly uncertain. And that is 
irrespective of the model structure. So that's the big one. We just don't know how many cases there have been. And the reason for that is because, of course, we haven't had sufficient testing capacity. There are many people who are asymptomatic. The tests themselves have different sensitivity and specificity, and people are only testing positive for some course, part of their infection and so on. So uncertainty around how many cases there even are in a given population is probably the biggest source of uncertainty in all of the models. The other uncertainties that arise are really because this is a new virus. So we don't know every aspect of its transmission and we don't understand everything about the biology. So there's a big uncertainty about immunity, whether people are protected against reinfection once they've had the virus, and if so, how long for. Things like that are still very highly uncertain. Similarly, we don't know about things like transmission in children, although we're starting to gain a better appreciation for that. And then finally, We've put in such drastic changes to the contact structures that underlie the spread of the virus between people by social distancing and these other kinds of interventions. We've really changed the structure of our populations. And what that means is that the mechanism by which the virus spreads between people, i.e. close contact between them, is very hard to model. And that makes it very hard to anticipate what might happen if you put in place some other interventions, or you loosen social distancing and so on, because we find it hard. We actually don't have a lot of data quantifying contact rates between people in normal life, let alone during these quite strict social distancing interventions. The United States is currently seeing spikes in COVID-19 cases in several states, Arizona, Florida, Texas, among them. Are there data on the infection trends from places like New York and Massachusetts that could be used to create more accurate models for these current hotspots? Or would that be a case of trying to transfer one curve to another location and failing? No, I think we can definitely learn a lot about the epidemic as it's progressed. And indeed, we have. And so models are constantly being updated and improved as we learn more. And I think the, the lessons from New York and Massachusetts and Seattle really have given us good insights into things like the importance of crowds, the importance of indoor transmission, the extent to which social distancing efforts have worked. And so that is something that we can transfer to other populations around the country in Florida and Texas. Of course, the populations themselves will be different. The demographic structure is different, the different comorbidities and so on. And we need to account for those differences as well as the geographic patterns of contacts and so on. But the fundamental transmission biology of the virus is definitely something that we've been learning as we've progressed. And that's something that we can absolutely add into the models of different parts of the country. What do the various models predict will happen as society begins to reopen in states that have had substantial outbreaks? Well, it's interesting. I think it's clear that the reason that the epidemics have gone away is really because we've introduced these very strong interventions of social distancing, not because the number of susceptible people has run out. So it's not like a forest fire that's spread through all the trees and there's no more trees left. What's happened is that we have reduced the contact rate to such an extent that the virus couldn't spread anymore. But once we reverse that and we start to increase the contact rate again, there's no reason to think that the virus won't come back because it has not been eliminated and there are many, many people still susceptible. In fact, the recent seroprevalence survey from Spain suggests that we are very, very far from having infected enough people that we will have herd immunity to the virus. So it seems likely, because most people are still susceptible, that as we reopen, we will expect a resurgence of cases. And so it's just a question of how we manage and control the reopening strategies in order to make sure that we don't overrun our hospital system and suffer too much uh, morbidity and mortality when we do. Finally, what have epidemiologists learned during this pandemic about how policymakers and the general public engage with or understand models? Well, I think that we have certainly seen an increased interest in the use of models for trying to understand infectious disease epidemiology. We've also seen an interesting backlash against not just models, but science as well, as the public kind of grapples with what it means to contain this virus and as policymakers start to push back against the idea of social distancing and keeping the, the society under lockdown. 
And of course, lockdown is a very extreme measure and intervention in the face of what is really hopefully once in a lifetime pandemic of this kind. So I think it's been interesting. I hope that we can learn to be better at communicating our science so that people can understand that there are many uncertainties associated with model forecasts when we have a new virus and things are changing very quickly. But I hope that we can also convey the importance of using rigorous quantitative frameworks to help us think through the possibilities of how to deal with this epidemic. And I hope that policymakers will really start to take on board the need to have a systematic approach to pandemic preparedness as well as epidemic response that engages the scientific community in a more comprehensive way. Thank you, Professor Buckey.